I now look to Richard Humphreys to close the debate as a whole. Mr. President, honourable members, distinguished guests, Mr. Secretary, ladies and gentlemen. I gather when the Pakistani National Security Advisor was here yesterday, he opened his address by saying, Mr. President, Mr. Stephen, and he had a, a pictures from your Facebook page of yourself swilling cocktails, which he then showed. And I'm sorry I missed that trick. If I'd only known that was allowed by the rules of the society, I would, I would have done so. It is, it is truly wonderful, as, as uh, certainly we on this side of the House have said, to be here in the most prestigious university in the world and to be speaking at the most prestigious debating society in the world. We in Dublin follow many of the Oxford traditions very closely. Uh, for example, every, more or less every Monday night, I like to tune in to see Paxo declare in Oxford College uh, the winners of their round in university challenge. Um, normally by beating uh, college from Cambridge and um, it's nice to see that uh, even some Cambridge people are coming up in the world. I gather the honorary uh, treasurer-elect is, is uh, moving on to greater things now here taking up a role in, in this um, institution. Uh, can I thank you Mr President and um, indeed the, the honourable librarian-elect for his role in the matter of having this debate at all because the value of this debate uh, can only be to promote greater understanding and mutual understanding between um, all the different participants, and particularly between Ireland and Britain. And that's certainly something that's very much needed. The story of Ireland and the story of Britain are is essentially is the story of lives intertwined. I mean, as Mike has said, identity is no longer a binary thing. There's degrees of Irishness, degrees of Britishness, degrees of Europeanness, and certainly we need that tremendous understanding. I was reminded of it just to give you one small example. Downstairs in the library, I pulled out uh, one of the parliamentary debates, which you have beautifully um, on the on the shelves there, in very English fashion. The new series of parliamentary debates starts in 1820. Um, well, I pulled out a volume which had a contribution by my great grandfather, who was a, a nationalist member of the House of Commons, and that was at a time when. I suppose there were nationalist members speaking in the House of Commons, uh, not the case at the moment. Every student knows that you have to answer the question asked. And of course, the question before the House tonight is not whether a United Ireland is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, and indeed, I'm very glad of that because uh, that's a political question which I'm going to leave to all these wonderful politicians here. Uh, so nothing I say trespasses into the political area. And if you think it does, that's your mistake, not mine. <laughs> Um, the question before the House is whether Ireland is ready for a united Ireland, and we on this side of the House say that's a very easy question. And, you know, in my role now as sort of concluding and summing up the debate, um, I'm sure I'm not the only one, you're a very enlightened, very perceptive audience, and I'm sure I'm not the only person to have noticed that there's massive consensus uh, here on, on both sides that the answer to that is definitely not. Um, that's that's <clears throat> perhaps if we disregard the librarian-elect, as I'm sure you frequently do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there may be some disagreement about, OK, is the United Ireland a good thing, a bad thing? When might it happen? Whether Ireland will be ready for it? Those political questions, of course, naturally, some disagreement, but there's broad consensus, pretty much unanimity, that Ireland's not ready right now, for a number of reasons. The Good Friday Agreement and the United Kingdom law specifies that first requires a border poll. The requirement for a border poll only applies if the Secretary of State thinks it's going to be passed. That's not the case at the moment. Secondly, it's premature to plan in detail for United Ireland when there isn't even a functioning executive, uh, and when the Good Friday Agreement institutions, or the major ones, aren't working. Some of them are, but the major ones, uh, the devolved institutions, aren't. And thirdly, uh, before you could have a, a, a detailed plan for United Ireland, there has to be a conversation to work through the implications of that, and that hasn't happened. The first point is very simple. Um, right now, there are, there are 39 nationalist MLAs out of 90, so 43%. Uh, for nationalism to find the extra 7% is going to take time. There's certainly no way you can say that nationalist majority uh, is there now such as would, would be likely to pass a border poll, such as would trigger the obligation to have one. 
Um, now it's true, you know, it is true, and Mike very fairly acknowledged there are demographic changes, there are political changes, um, certain elements of the ground are shifting. Brexit obviously has been a major change. It may, you know, this is more an empirical observation. I'm neutral as to whether Brexit's a good idea or a bad idea, but history may conclude that it was um, a huge own goal for proponents of a union. History will tell. Um, I would just say one thing though, the phrase that was used on that side of the house about a sectarian headcount, and I think we just need to be careful about that phrase, um, and I'll tell you why. The Good Friday Agreement works on the basis of reciprocity and equality of rights. Uh, unionism is not an inherently superior concept to nationalism and vice versa. Um, people who talk about, well, you can't have a United Ireland with a sectarian headcount, they only apply that logic to United Ireland. You never hear people saying, well, we can't have a United Kingdom on the basis of a sectarian headcount. And if you think about it, the two have to be reciprocal because equality of rights and equality of identity is absolutely built into the agreement and it's built into any future for the North. The agreement is, is premised on the basis that power is to be shared, equality between the traditions, strong protections for human rights. The 50% plus one as to which state you end up in is just the tiebreaker on that constitutional issue where there isn't any other um, ready option. That's the first point. The, the nationalist majority is, isn't there. The second point, well, isn't there right now. The second point is, um, in practical terms, there are just more immediate challenges. I mean, the most obvious one is, well, the, the two most obvious ones are devolution not functioning and the immediate challenge of Brexit. I mean, there just isn't enough bandwidth to resolve those problems until we get through certainly to find out what shape uh, Brexit is going to take. I mean, to put it another way, you can only deal with one constitutional crisis at a time. Uh, uh, so much has to be done to bed down Northern Ireland as a functioning uh, entity uh, in terms of its governance, its constitutional arrangements, the, the culture of public life. Uh, you know, the idea that you can have a vote on the United Ireland and uh, bring, bring in or, or uh, to the 26 counties, a, a very divided society with no functioning parliament, no functioning government. Um, I mean, that sounds like a recipe for chaos. Um, in practical terms, that's the immediate problem. And, and I think, you know, you've heard from the proposition side, whether you believe in a United Ireland or a United Kingdom, uh, the one thing you should be able to agree on is that the people of Northern Ireland need to be able to uh, live together, in harmony, to make their institutions work, to share their piece of ground. The logic of that is everything has to be done, everything possible has to be done to restore the Good Friday institutions uh, and to make Northern Ireland work. Now, um, the, I, I don't want to be too hard on the Honourable Librarian-elect, but uh, he, <laughs> he did um, criticise the Good Friday Agreement as, as stymieing progress in Northern Ireland and so on. Well, look, I would say to that, don't knock it. Uh, it is an internationally binding agreement between the two governments. It's not just a political agreement. Uh, you can't change it without the consent of the Irish government. Um, nobody's come up with a better solution. I mean, it, it has its critics, and it's certainly not without its problems. I'd be the first to say that. Um, but nobody's come up with a better solution. So, uh, as I say, in fairness to the Honourable um, Librarian-elect, he did say that you can, uh, you can be Irish and still not understand uh, the situation, and he certainly demonstrated that anyway. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, but don't, don't, don't take my word for it, as I say, his own side tore that argument to pieces. Um, look, the, uh, going beyond just the question of the executive, I mean, the broader issue about parity of esteem and equality of rights, uh, that's something that cuts both ways. I mean, I, can I just give you two examples? Um, I, the Irish identity in Northern Ireland uh, remains to some extent, uh, to, to some limited extent, second class. For example, because there is a statute passed by the Irish Parliament in 1737 that uh, prohibits the use of Irish in court. Now, from a Dublin perspective, that seems very strange, uh, but it's, from a Good Friday Agreement perspective, how do you reconcile that with parity of esteem and equality between the traditions? Uh, other side of the coin, the British identity is to some extent second class in the 26 counties, 
we say in the Good Friday Agreement, which is in the Constitution, that we want to give, uh, we acknowledge we'll take steps to recognise the equality of the traditions, but we don't allow British citizens to vote in referenda, for example. And if there was a United Ireland under the current Constitution, it would mean anyone of a unionist slash British identity couldn't vote in a referendum without declaring themselves to be Irish. So again, a lot of these identity issues, um, we say, need to be worked through, uh, and there are benefits for both sides. Okay, I'm told that I'm, I'm out of time. So can I just conclude on this very final point? Um, uh, Colm said that one, um, for, uh, one for possible first step to progress might be to pick up on the work of the New Ireland Forum. Um, that's a political question, certainly, but there may be something to it. The New Ireland Forum ended and wasn't able to agree a report on the question of recognising British identity in the 26 counties, and maybe that would be a good place to start. Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs>